people live in a world of their own making. Frankly, that seems to be the problem. Welcome to Angry Planet. Hello and welcome to Angry Planet. I am Jason Fields. And I'm Matthew Galt. Today, we're going to talk about conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are part of the foundation of the United States. Our first strong third party, the anti-Masonic party, had its roots in the belief in a conspiracy theory. Years later, the John Birch Society shaped American politics. But things feel very different now. Lies are doing something to the United States that no foreign enemy has been able to achieve. Shredding it. The bizarre QAnon imaginary purple elephant and far more dangerous, the big lie of the stolen election. It's time to talk about our gaslit nation and what this conspiratorial bullshit means going forward. Joining us to do just that is Joseph Yashinsky. He's a professor of political science at the University of Miami. He's the co-author of American Conspiracy Theories, came out in 2014, and editor of Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them, which was from 2018. And we're very lucky to have him. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can we start with something really basic? What is wrong with this country? Why are so many people so eager to believe things that are provably untrue? That doesn't feel like a basic question to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's just the fa foundationals may be better than basic. Well, people believe conspiracy theories for the same reasons they believe all sorts of other ideas. And one thing that's interesting is you said that things feel different now. They might feel different now. But are they different? That's a very different question. And that's something where the data tells a story that is different than what we might feel, right? Partially because what's going on is that we're paying very close attention to conspiracy theories in a way we never have before. In fact, news organizations, many of them have desks dedicated to misinformation, conspiracy theories, disinformation. Even the government has tried to put together a board just to focus on that. And there have been congressional committees, you know, having hearings on, on these topics. So we're paying attention, but that's very different than saying there's more of something than there has been in the past, right? Those are two different claims. And, you know, when I started out as a political scientist, I was studying media coverage of events and how does the media cover things. And, and one thing that is very clear with the media is that more coverage of a topic doesn't actually mean that that thing is actually happening more. Those are very different things, right? <laughs> so so that can be the same thing with conspiracy theories. We're paying a lot of attention now, but is anyone really different now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Feels like it, but isn't. It is it? And th that's where the data has to come in. Well, I'm wondering about the impact really in terms of when I talk about it being different. I mean, I can, you make your point makes perfect sense to me. And I remember very well the summer of the shark attack right before September 11th, where all of a sudden there were, we thought a billion shark attacks and it was total crap. All right. Is there anything qualitatively different, if not quantitatively different to what's going on now, in your opinion? I think the quantitative difference, and we can call it qualitative because it's such a small number, really comes down to one person, and that was the president, <laughs> right? So you take a bunch of conspiracy theories that were probably floating around anyway, and you put them in the, in the hands of somebody who has a huge audience, and all of a sudden, things are going to feel very different, right? So why did the media have to start covering conspiracy theories so much? Well, because you have a major party candidate in 2016 talking in conspiracy theories all the time and then becoming president and continuing to engage in conspiracy theories all the time. So at that point, it's not just Trump's conspiracy theories that are the issue, but it's also conspiracy theories as a thing unto itself. 
that journalists have to start paying attention to and what's the effect of, of Trump's rhetoric having on people and, and what are the outcomes of this? So in terms of the mass public and what they believe, I mean, the numbers tell a fairly convincing story that most conspiracy theories are not increasing in the percentage of number, the percentage of people who believe them. They're fairly stable over time. Either people believe an idea or they don't, right? Um, but it doesn't look like that simply because of the effect Trump and a few other people have had on our mainstream discourse. Do you think the media bears some responsibility here too? I mean, just by covering it, by having desks about it, by focusing so much on it, by putting it out there constantly, do you think that helps the spread or is it just kind of a, is it just kind of an indicator of where our focus is and where our interest is at the moment? So how much am I allowed to swear on this podcast? You can say whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Well, this is what's happened in the last few years. We have some people who've become very puritanical about truth and at the same time um, not very even-handed in how they apply their standards to deciding what's true and what's not and what needs to be moderated and what doesn't and what's, what's open for being censored and what shouldn't be censored. You know, conveniently, everyone wants to censor the other guy's ideas because the other guy's ideas are the ones that are false. It's the other guy that believes in conspiracy theories because my conspiracy theories are true. They're conspiracy facts. So everyone's pointing the finger at everybody else's ideas to have them have them censored. But here's the thing. There's a lot of mainstream media coverage saying, oh, my God, social media is spreading all these conspiracy theories and everyone's becoming a conspiracy theorist now and they're all acting on these ideas. So the blame is put squarely on social media. I mean, some media outlets even just say it right out. Zuckerberg is a Bond villain. He's coming for your children. That's a quote from The Guardian. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, and, quote. and there's a lot of people saying, you know, big name celebrities and whatnot saying, oh, the misinformation conspiracy theories are worse than they've ever been because of social media. It's Facebook's fault. It's, it's Twitter's fault. Well, go put on TV and look at all the crap that's on there and look at all the different programs that are either patently false or just aren't very well evidenced. How many shows about Bigfoot are there? How many shows about hibernating vampires who are responsible for murders in California are there? What was the biggest show on Animal Planet? Oh, it was the Navy conspiracy to kill the mermaids with supersonic weapons. What's the second biggest show on that channel, which I thought was supposed to be about real, real animals? No, it's Finding Bigfoot. Guess what? They still haven't found him. Go put on all the other channels, and they're hunting ghosts and paranormal experiences and demons and Loch Ness monsters and all sorts of stuff. And there's all sorts of TV shows about all sorts of conspiracy theories. So to turn around and say now, oh, it must be social media's fault, it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, this stuff is everywhere. Even go to the newspapers. I mean, many still have horoscopes. Uh, many engage in conspiracy theories. How much coverage has the New York Times and Washington Post in the last few years given to all this alien nonsense in which there's nothing there? But it drives clicks. So here's another story about some grainy video that doesn't show anything, but it could look like an alien. <laughs> so it, 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 what bothers me is that this is everywhere. Even the conspiracy theory you brought up earlier, QAnon, the idea that there's a pedophile deep state working against the president, that's not new. That's the plot of Oliver Stone's JFK movie, right? The, Joe, Joe Pesci was the pedophile character who was involved in the, you know, the sexual underground of New Orleans and one of the people involved in shooting Kennedy in 1963. So the ideas are not, are not new. This is all around. It's been everywhere and it's been in the mainstream. Researched in the 1980s, too. They tried to link some Reagan staffers with it, I believe, right? They said they were having rent boys come in to parties and also, of course, the satanic panic stuff. Like, again, all this stuff comes around and around and around. Yeah, right? and you just had a representative saying that he's been invited to a bunch of eyes wide shut type parties. <laughs> right. Now, yeah. now, whether that's true or not, 
you know, I don't think the evidence is in his favor, but um, <laughs> well, I hope so for his. But sake. these claims are coming from from the mainstream. They're coming from the top. So to act as if it's social media's problem or if it's new, it's just there's no there's no evidence for that. Okay, so I have a question to try to differentiate some of this stuff if we can, because sure. it sounds like it's all the same bucket of slop, but. Is there such a thing as the big lie as opposed to – which I, I love that phrase with the capital B and the, the capital L versus your run-of-the-mill conspiracy theory like you know Hitler and the stab in the back. And of course, you know me and you know enough to know that my wife works – you know, it, there's going to be the Holocaust and there's going to be you know Adolf Hitler for a second. We can get rid of him in a second too. But – yeah, is there something different? Is there something like – is there a big line? Is that a conspiracy theory or not a conspiracy theory? Is it the same crap? Well, the question is why are we calling it big? And there could be a lot of reasons. I'm not saying that it's wrong to call it that, but is it big because of the number, the percentage of Republicans that believe it? I mean, if that's why we're saying it, then sure, right? Are we calling it the big lie because a lot of Republican – leaders believe it and are acting on it trying to hurt our democracy by restricting voting that seems big to me but in terms of the idea itself there's nothing really new or big about about it every election there's there's beliefs that it was rigged and it's always the losers who think it was rigged against them right so so there's nothing new here, and it's, 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 it's sour grapes after every election. We must remember 2000, right? 2000 and 2004, and there wasn't that much in 2008, except for the idea that Barack Obama wasn't really a citizen, so he illegally usurped the presidency. But then in 2012, there were rumors going around that Acorn had rigged the election in favor of Obama against Romney, even though Acorn didn't even exist at that point. And then 2016, oh, it was rigged by Trump and Russia, right? And then, and then now, oh, now Biden must have rigged it. So the losers always think they were cheated, a certain amount of them. Usually it's 30 to 40% of the losing party. Now, after 2020, it's like 60 to 80% of the losing party, right? Which is abnormal. So the question becomes, why is it so much more this year than in past years? And it's because of Trump. Mitt Romney didn't go on TV and tell all Republicans it was rigged against me. I was cheated. Romney conceded and moved on with his life. Right. And so did McCain. Right. So so whereas Trump is saying it's rigged, he's still saying it's rigged. And people are listening. And you've got members of Congress saying it was rigged. And the conservative radio sphere and in, in, in Fox News are still engaging in this. So, yes, it's a conspiracy theory. But oftentimes these theories are coming, you know, from one place or another. But here it's like a mainstream view coming from the, from the entire conservative media sphere and, and, and the GOP leadership. So... In that sense, it's just taken on, it's, it's become just like any other partisan belief, right? Many of the party leaders and the, main, and, the, and the conservative media support it, and everyone's just following along in the party. Is there a point for you when, you know a lot about this stuff, you know the history of it. Is there a point for you when something crosses the line from... Uh, Business is normal into dangerous. It's, it's hard to know what that line is. And I get asked this a lot. Like, how can we differentiate the okay conspiracy theories from the really dangerous ones? And the answer is, I don't know if there's a good way to do that. Yeah, I can just say, oh, well, here's an idea and that's dangerous. You know, I, I guess I would put ideas that target vulnerable populations into that category um, because if someone were to act on it they would be attacking vulnerable populations in which case they could do a lot of damage but in terms of a lot of other conspiracy theories it's, it's hard to guess in advance which ones are going to attract lots of followers 
which ones are going to lead people to act on them in some deleterious way. I mean, I guess the danger signs for me are when you have politicians adopting them and then acting on them with an authority of of or, 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 or with a monopoly of authoritative force. Because when they do that, that's really, really bad, right? But it, 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 someone could take something like the idea that lizard people control the world. And for most people, oh, that's stupid or silly, or some people have fun with it on YouTube or whatever. But somebody just stabbed his kids and killed them because he thought that they were lizard people. Now, the question then becomes at that point, is it the idea's fault that he did that or the fact that he's probably insane that he did that, right? And and further, and I think it's been part of the conversation in America, certainly, do you then ban David Ick books because they contain that idea? I would ban them because he's a terrible writer. <laughs> <laughs> but, I've had to read some of that stuff. And it's like, ah. take, take something else. Take like vaccine hesitancy, right? We've got all these vaccine conspiracy theories going around. So the question becomes, are, they, are these ideas dangerous? Well, if they lead people to eschew the vaccine, then yes, right? And people wind up getting sick and dying. But what if... It's not the conspiracy theory that's really doing it. I mean, maybe they're just adopting the conspiracy theory after the fact to justify actions they were going to take anyway, which seems to often be the case. And this, this issue is compounded further with the fact that a lot of people believe true information and will come to the conclusion that they don't want to get the vaccine. Right? So you will hear people say, oh, wow, you can get vaccinated, but you could still catch COVID anyway which is true. And then they say, therefore, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get vaccinated. So are we going to ban the true information now because we want people to do the right thing? I mean, these things are really, really complicated. And just, just saying, well, these ideas are too dangerous for anyone to be exposed to sort of overestimates the power of, of ideas and exposure to those ideas and takes away anyone's agency to be able to you know, not believe things that they're exposed to or to not act after exposure. So this is, the, I think, and we've talked about this before, I think, with Danny Gold, Jason, but I'm not sure if we talked about it off air. We may have talked about it off air, but like I live in this intellectual space in my brain and have for maybe the past 10 years where I want to believe in the power of ideas and their ability to change the world and, and do things, right? Like, why else are we communicating? Why else are we talking to each other and spreading these theories? But I also, I don't quite believe that someone reads the Turner Diaries and that alone is the thing that sets them on like a path to white nationalism and committing a mass shooting, right? And so it's hard for me to square in my head the, the power of communication and art with the fact that if that's true, if there is power in communication and art, is it not possible that some things could be quite dangerous and that if the wrong person reads the wrong thing, it could set them on a dangerous path? Does that question make sense? It's not even a question. It's just an observation, I guess. Yeah, so the action really comes down to the wrong person, right? So is the problem the information or the problem the fact that some people are inclined towards violence, Right, because they can find people will find a reason to act violently if they if if they're violent people. Let's look at the case from just a few weeks ago with the with the white genocide believer shooting people at a grocery store in New York. What's come out about this person is that he says he was bored, so then he went to 4chan. And a lot of people are saying, well, 4chan radicalized him. Now, that's an interesting thing to think. It's sort of like saying I was bored and decided to read a book. So I went and got Mein Kampf. You know, there's other books you can read. So the question is, why did you pick to read Mein Kampf? Just like, you know, I was bored, so I went to 4chan. Why did you go to 4chan and then pick a, a bunch of anti-Semitic pages in it? You know, you didn't slip on a banana peel and wind up there. It wasn't by accident. So the choices were driving this person to everything that he exposed himself to. And we have to give him the agency 
he made choices of things that he wanted to see, and he kept making those choices over and over and over again, right? Because we can all be exposed to anti-Semitic ideas and racist ideas, and we'll be like, that's not influencing me. I'm rejecting that, right? So it comes down to why was this person so open to it? And it, and it's almost as if we we give these online platforms incredible powers, as if you know it's it's that scene from Clockwork Orange where someone goes to 4chan and all of a sudden they're locked down in their chair with their eyes gripped open and getting drops, so they're just being exposed over and over again without any choice, and that's not what's happening. So we we have to sort of step back because often the story we're hearing is social media then violence. And we got to say, what is it about this person that that made them amenable to these ideas? And then to go seek them out over and over. And then also to want to commit violence on them, which is almost a separate question. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So there, there was, a, I think, an NPR story that came out a few weeks ago. And it was about a woman who refused the vaccine and then died of it. And now her family is heartbroken. She died of COVID because she wasn't vaccinated. She And I think she refused treatment even once they got her to the hospital because she said this is all fake. So people are saying this is the misinformation and disinformation that killed her. And even her family is saying this. Disinformation online killed her. But read a little bit deeper. I mean, she had been engaging in nonsense for decades she was she was reading horoscopes or doing astrological signs and doing readings for people. So she was already prone to believing a lot of unscientific stuff. Are and and on and, and on top of that, anytime anyone brought up these issues to her, she would get angry. So her husband couldn't negotiate these ideas with her. In fact, he had to leave the room whenever he would bring these things up. So is it the information that's the problem or is it the, you know, what this woman was bringing to the table? And and I feel bad, you know, no one wants to blame, you know, a poor woman who passed away of COVID, but she made choices. Are we all susceptible to the right conspiracy theory? I mean, are we all just sitting here waiting for the correct one to hit us in the soft spot and we'll believe it? Yes, and, and this is the interesting thing. So the more and more conspiracy theories I put on any given survey, the less and less people there are that don't believe any. So there's no distinction between us and the conspiracy theorists, right? We all fall into that category from time to time. So if we're to ask enough questions, we're all going to buy into one or a few. The distinction is between people who buy into a lot and people who buy into a few. Which ones do you buy into? And, yeah, and then we can make another distinction between which ones people will buy into, which is usually determined by who they are, what their politics are, what groups they belong to. So I haven't met a person who, who's like, I don't believe any conspiracy theories once you start listing off a bunch, right? And maybe I'm the exception to the rule only because I don't believe anything anymore. <laughs> so... I, I don't think that I'm that resistant to conspiracy theories if the right one were to hit me, but it's just in general, I'm just like, I'm not believing anything because I've spent so much time on this and so many things. I'm just wary that it's probably my own biases driving me <laughs> towards it. What are the most common ones? What are the ones you bust out at the cocktail party to, to make people go like, oh, I guess I do believe this? Well, JFK is probably the most consistently and widely believed conspiracy theory in the U.S., so only a few weeks after the assassination, it was polled, and it came in at 50%, 5-0. By the 70s, it was 80%, and it's only come down in the last 20-some-odd years to where it's back around 50% again. So that's, that's with us. I don't know when that's going to start dipping because it's so ingrained in the culture. I mean, we hear about it in every November – to mark the anniversary of the assassination and we've got movies and, and all sorts of stuff. There's always going to be a new document dump from the government and things like that. So I think it's here to stay and that's consistently higher than most other conspiracy theories. Jason, what conspiracy theory do you believe? Do you, do you, what do you think I about Kennedy think lone gunman? That's really a great one, you know, cause I've covered that and the anniversaries, obviously I, 
even I am too young to have been uh, a reporter at the Kennedy uh, assassination. But yeah, there's part of me that does ask questions. I, I hate to say that. But it's true. <laughs> I think I think the more you learn about Oswald and his activities leading up, like really get into the minute details of the the couple years of his life leading up to that assassination. And yeah, it was him. It makes a lot of sense that it was him. There's a pattern of writings and ideology that makes sense that it was him. There was a previous attempt on a huge right winger that he probably was responsible for. It's just, right. I don't know. You know, what, are, what I, about Jack Ruby? I, what I'm about Jack Ruby? He like <sighs> he's a, an idiot, <laughs> an idiot mobster in the Dallas area that thought he was doing everybody a favor, probably. Thank you. I mean, here's here's the thing. This has gone on for decades, obviously, and mm -hmm. and you know anyone can pick out a bunch of anecdotes and say, well, there's this data point and that data point, and you know it makes it look funny and you know suggests a conspiracy, but when you take all the evidence together, all of a sudden it, it, it doesn't really look that way. I mean, I used to be convinced that there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. But and, and a lot of it was driven by the Oliver Stone movie, which came out when I was in high school. But having shown that movie in class over and over again, that movie doesn't even stand on its own. It's internally contra it internally contradicts itself. And and further, even Stone said, I made a lot of this stuff up. Right. So in order to get there, you have to start filling in all the holes of the conspiracy theory with a lot of things that aren't necessarily true. So and sure. I mean, we can go back and forth with anecdotes, but I mean, it's been looked at quite comprehensively in, yeah. in the evidence for the conspiracy is not there. Now, here's the thing with me is I don't walk around telling people their conspiracy theories are false. I mean, that's not what I do. I'm not a debunker. I'm not really interested in that. I'll leave that to people who are experts in the particular subject matter at hand. Like, you know, I'll let people who are in, in, into studying guns and assassinations and forensic evidence and things like that look at the Kennedy assassination. But, you know, my general view is that if the appropriate bodies of experts with open data and evidence haven't concluded that there's a conspiracy, then I'm not going to do, to do that either. And I'm not the one you need to convince, right? So just, so just the same thing, just to put this with evolution. If you think evolution is fake or a fraud, don't convince me. Go convince the majority of biologists out there. It does sound like, okay, is any of this a factor of intelligence? You, I think we'd like to say yes, but there isn't good evidence of that. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to close the door on it and say that intelligence doesn't matter at all. I'm sure it matters a little bit. But I think the closest I could get to saying yes would be that consistently we find that people with less education tend to believe more conspiracy theories across the population. But that doesn't mean that highly educated people don't buy into conspiracy theories. I mean, I've been to faculty meetings. <laughs> There's all sorts of conspiracy theories there. The administration's out to get us. Right? So, so having a PhD doesn't make you immune. And a lot of the pushback I get on my papers comes from PhDs, some of whom were convinced that some of the things I call conspiracy theories are not really conspiracy theories, but true. So... Do you think there's a reason why human beings are programmed to believe these things? Well, I don't think they're programmed. So I, I, I don't like the word unless we're saying there's sort of there's a bunch of factors that sort of make them amenable to these ideas. Yeah, I think, I think that's I think pretty that's much it. Not not that there's somebody that's making us believe these things, but it's just kind of the way we're wired. So it's not right. the chip in the neck that's doing right. it. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that's used for something else, actually. That's, that, that, yeah, that's just for tracking. So here's the thing, is that the reasons for people believing conspiracy theories are largely the reasons for believing anything else, right? There's often this view like, Oh, why do you believe something? Oh, it's because it's true. That's why I believe it. But you can find someone else who believes the opposite thing, right? 
And why do they believe it? Well, because it's true. So it's not like ideas have magic shining qualities that let us know that they're true or false and that the pe people who believe things we think are false are picking them out because they're false, right? Nobody sees a false idea and says, well, I'm going to believe that because it's false. It doesn't work like that. People believe things because they think they're true. It's just that separating fact from fiction is very difficult and we're all biased in numerous ways. So it leads us to adopt ideas that some are true, some could be true, but we don't know, and some are probably false, right? And in and, and that set of factors operates for all the beliefs we, we adopt, right? So, you, you know, if you, you can ask a question, why do people have political opinions? Well, some of the big reasons are their partisanship drives them to adopt certain policies and they listen to leaders in their party and they say what the issue agenda is and what the policies are going to be. And people follow, you know, cues from their leaders to adopt particular positions. And But that works with conspiracy theories, too. People listen to trusted sources and they adopt ideas that they think are likely true. Right. So there's really no difference there. Right. Just as. A Democrat might listen to what Obama says, and Trump supporters would listen to what Trump says. And if Trump engages in conspiracy theories, then his followers are going to adopt some of those to an extent, right? And just the same, you know, the groups we belong to drive which conspiracy theories we adopt. Who's conspiring? It's always the other groups conspiring against us. Our group isn't the villain. It's all the other groups, right? Right. So, but everybody thinks everyone else is the conspirator, never ourselves. So we disagree. And, and as I mentioned before, we all, to one degree or another, have a disposition towards seeing the world in conspiratorial terms. So some people have this very strongly. Some people have it very weakly. Most people are somewhere in the middle, right? So if you're someone who has a lens, which makes everything look like a conspiracy, then you're going to see a lot of conspiracy th conspiracies everywhere. And you are going to particularly be prone to believing ones that accuse groups that, that are in competition with your own, right? So that sort of explains a lot of it, but those factors are similar to almost any other belief that we might adopt. So I want to go back and talk to some of the policy prescriptions and response to this conspiracy culture that's that's kind of going on right now it, it seems like from the the mainstream that the in the instinct right now is that the only way to fight these bad ideas is censoriousness i think about you know the new york post's twitter account being suspended when it ran the hunter biden laptop story which you know say what you will about the the hinkiness of that particular story like a Mac shop did have a Hunter Biden laptop with some pretty nasty stuff on it. And the talking about the Buffalo shooter, he wrote this 180 page manifesto that is shit posting, bad memes, stuff copied from 4chan. It was considered very dangerous for this thing to be out. And if you were the kind of person inclined to want to seek it out and find it, like you could find it pretty easily. Like I know where it is. I've read it. But there was an instinct on some parts of the media class to say, like, we need to make sure that nobody can see this thing. That this information doesn't spread, that it's bad information, that it will make another Buffalo shooter. Why do you think that this censoriousness is what I will call it, is the answer that we have to conspiracy theories right now? Why are we go moving in that direction? Because... Like conspiracy theories themselves, blaming the internet allows us to blame a boogeyman. It allows us to, to blame some outside factor that's, that's controlling events. It's Zuckerberg. It's Twitter. You know, it's the internet. It's something outside of us. It's exogenous. And it's neat and tidy, right? You don't have to deal with any complexity. Oh, just take it off the internet. Problem solved. You know, who wants to deal with with having to, to – with the fact that just people are prone to these ideas? We know this. We've known for a long time that Nazis exist. It's not a new thing, not a product of social media. We know that people commit violence for reasons that don't make sense. 
out of hatred or, or who knows what. Sometimes people just do terrible things. And we don't want to accept it because it's chaotic and it's messy. And it leaves us in a very uncertain place. Right? But if we could just blame something discreet and do something, then, oh, problem solved. It's easy to sleep at night then. But that's just not, it's just not the case. Right? So, and, and, and it's like people, people are doing exactly what conspiracy theorists might be doing, trying to find that simple explanation, find that one thing to blame that they already don't like. It doesn't, you know, unfortunately, it's, 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 it's not that, it doesn't provide that much explanatory power. Simple solutions for complicated problems. Yeah, I, I, I mean, what I'm finding more and more is that, sure, exposure to these ideas matter a certain bit, but it's what the people are bringing with them. So people talk about the Internet as if it's the case that, oh, I'm going to go on Twitter and get my share of conspiracy theories today. Oh, I'm going to go to Facebook and get all my, you know, anti-vax stuff today. As if that's all people go to the Internet for. And it's just not true. I mean, when you look at how accessed a lot of these things are, they pale in comparison to, you know, more mainstream outlets of news. Right. So when Alex Jones was sort of at, at his height, say five or six years ago, I remember looking at web traffic and InfoWars was ranked at like 350 in the U.S. for web traffic sites. New York Times is in like top 10. And in between there was porn and travel sites and dating sites, all sorts of things. So people are going to the Internet to do all sorts of things before they get their conspiracy theories. Right. So, yes, the beliefs are prevalent, but it's not the case. It's necessarily being driven by Internet exposure. And it's it's just not clear that you go to the Internet and it's all unsubstantiated stuff. I mean, people are going there to get true information. We have the world's library in our pocket. So we have access to, to more and better information now than we've ever had in the past, yet we're only focusing on the untrue stuff, which was always there in one form or the other, internet or not. I think uh, that's a terrific place to stop. Joseph Yashinsky, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking us through all this. Thank you. Now I'm angry. <laughs> Good. <laughs> We've done Good we, like to leave, we, we like to leave people upset. I was trying to shout to keep in to you know to keep in line with the <laughs> the name of the podcast. That's all for this week, Angry Planet listeners. As always, Angry Planet is me, Matthew Galt, Jason Fields, and Kevin O'Dell. It's created by myself and Jason Fields. We will be, uh, we've got some, we're recording two back-to-back tomorrow. Uh, should be some interesting stuff. Uh, I think we're going to get Danny Gold back on the show again. I know I keep saying that, but I, I just got to do it. All right. If you love us, if you really love us, please go to our Substack. AngryPlanetPod.com or AngryPlanet.Substack.com, where for mere $9 a month you can get commercial-free versions of all the mainline shows and bonus content as it's rolling out. One of the ones that we're recording tomorrow is going to be a bonus episode. We will be back, as always, next week with another conversation about conflict on an angry planet. Stay safe until then.